In a matter of minutes, a double murder is about to be committed in Georgia. The man is here again in my home. He came back through my door again. Okay, who's the man? Michael Buttram. Cops say Michael Buttram was obsessed with his ex fiancee Tara Cantrell. Last Monday, when he showed up at her house, Tara's mother, Millie, knew it meant trouble. Hold it! Mike, hold it! When 911 calls back, Buttram calmly answers, even though cops say he had just killed Tara and her mom. Hello? Okay, sir, can I speak to the lady, please? Yeah, hold on one second, okay? Cops say Buttram hung up, took off in Tara's 1995 Acura Integra. Cops think Buttram may be in Texas, but if you have anything to do with it, he'll be in jail before the night is over. It's Saturday, March 20th, 1999. To date, your tips have led to the captures of 555 fugitives. Tonight, on America's Most Wanted, America fights back. A daring jewelry store robbery is caught on tape. And a brave cop is caught in the crossfire. It was like a sledgehammer, a hard blow to my chest. Now, you're in for a wild ride on the streets of Jersey. Also tonight, Dr. Claudia Benton had the perfect life until... It's just like something evil that just dropped in from nowhere. She said she was murdered, and we all just started crying. Now, we're headed for the wrong side of the tracks to hunt down her killer. You ever heard of a guy named uh, Rafael Resendez Ramirez? He was known to be in this camp every so often. And this fugitive hides where people have nothing to hide. And he tries to hide behind a badge. He told me he was working undercover and he was tracking a fugitive. Will he get away with it? Tonight, we'll get to the bottom of it all. Because tonight, America's Most Wanted is where America fights back. Now, from our crime center in Washington, D.C., John Walsh. Good evening. It's one thing to watch our show and think you recognize one of our fugitives. But what if that fugitive were living in your own house? Well, two guys in Scottsdale, Arizona, lived through that experience. Meet Mark and his roommate, Braun, two generous guys. So generous, they let one of their co-workers, Micah, sleep on their couch until she got back on her feet. They thought she was great. We, we referred to her as Mama around here because she'd come in, she'd cook. She, she took care of us like we were boys, you know? We joking, I mean, I took her to my family function. She lots of times would be our designated driver, so we wouldn't have to worry about drinking and driving. This Denny's in Scottsdale is where the three met. Micah told them she was on the run from an abusive husband. She told us her entire life with her husband. He used to beat her consistently. He was very verbally abusive, physically abusive, of course. She told us that he came home from work one night. She made dinner for him. She made love to him. She got in her car. She drove to a bus stop. She crossed country and she never looked back. But the real reason Micah never looked back was because of something horrifying she left her husband to discover back in Tennessee. Come in to wake her up. I was going to take her with me. And I come in and felt her and she was cold and stiff. I left out of the room, went right to the phone and called 911. Richard is talking about his four-year-old granddaughter, Karina Rowan. Deputies say Micah, whose real name is Lena Townsend, beat little Karina to death. Deputies say Townsend took off and drove her Lincoln from Pinson, Tennessee to Conway, Arkansas. That's where she abandoned the car and left behind some clues. They found a hotel receipt, her cut hair, and remnants of dark brown hair dye. But Townsend was nowhere to be found until she was profiled on America's Most Wanted. Townsend may be hiding out in campgrounds. Decided to stay home on a Saturday night, which is funny, but we decided to stay home and make a nice dinner and just edge out, watch TV and uh, watch cops and watch America's Most Wanted like we usually do if we're home. And uh, I remember hearing at the intro of the show that um, there was a woman that was wanted for killing one of her grandchildren. And I remember just getting up to go flip the steak and thinking that's just really sick. And, they missed seeing Townsend's picture by moments. Her secret was still safe, but not for long. While Braun and Mark missed the photo, 
someone else caught it. Uh, America's Most Wanted received an anonymous phone call from an individual that had recognized her during the program. The tipster had seen Townsend working at the Denny's restaurant in Scottsdale. Agents quickly learned that she was living in this apartment complex with two male friends, going by the name Micah. The law enforcement officers uh, set up on the apartment, and at 7 a.m. in the morning, the Fugitive Task Force entered the apartment. Next thing I knew, I heard um, somebody inside the apartment screaming, maintenance, we have a water leak. As I got up, I heard him at the door, and I started to walk towards the door, and Micah came out after me, and I'm like, it's the maintenance, I've got it. Next thing I hear is FBI, you know, you need to come out of your room and put your hands out, and the whole nine yards from there. And they said, as soon as we clear the house and everything, we'll go ahead and uncuff you. And I said, what is going on? FBI agents made their way through the apartment and slapped handcuffs on the granny from hell. Braun and Mark couldn't believe what happened. It's um, very disheartening because of who we thought we were helping and who we thought she was as a person. We didn't get the picture of her being the type of person that could do something like we're hearing now. It's hard to un understand and believe. But it's true. Lena Townsend was charged with first-degree murder and aggravated child abuse. If found guilty, she could face life in prison or the death penalty. Our website received emails from more than 200 people, all pleading with us to do this next case. They're all people whose lives have been touched by Dr. Claudia Benton, a remarkable person, committed not only to her own kids, but to helping children everywhere. There are two things Dr. Claudia Benton lived for, her family and her work. If she wasn't at home, she was at the Baylor Medical Center in Houston. Claudia and her co-workers devoted themselves to genetic research for children. But one day something happened that shook the lives of everyone who ever knew Dr. Claudia Benton. The day started out like any other day. I was doing experiments. Our secretary came asking for Claudia's uh, beeper number or her cell phone number. And I asked him, you know, uh, why are you trying to get in contact with her? She said, well, she missed call this morning. And from that moment on, I knew something was very, very wrong. Uh, so we started looking for her and trying to find out what had happened to Claudia. And as time wore on, uh, the longer it got, the worse I felt about it. And this something had really happened. Claudia's co-workers knew her husband and daughters were out of town, so they called the police to go check on her and then waited anxiously at the hospital for the cops to call back. A bunch of us were standing outside in the, the secretary's office, and you could hear her that just, she just screamed through the door. And she came out, and she was just, she didn't say anything. And we were all quiet, and finally I just said, is she dead? And she said she was murdered. And... We just, we all just started crying. The night of December 16th, an intruder broke into Claudia's house, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and brutally raped, beat, then stabbed Dr. Benton to death. Then cops say the cold-hearted killer raided Claudia's refrigerator and made himself a snack. It's just, it's just like some, some, something evil that just, dropped in from, from nowhere. Well, that's what it seemed like, but West University, Texas is a beautiful, affluent neighborhood. Tree-lined streets, gorgeous homes. There hadn't been a single murder here for 14 years. So how did evil just happen to drop into town? The answer may lie less than 100 yards from the crime scene on the other side of those tracks. <laughs> Just behind those tracks is a transient camp whose residents come and go with the trains. We joined West University detective Ken Maha and his partner as they went hunting for clues in the hobo camp. Watch out for needles, nails and things. Lots of boozing and drinking. They found mattresses, grocery carts, a whiskey bottle, even a cleaver. Detective Maha thinks Claudia Benton's killer was living here before he fled. From there, I believe he came walking down the street at one time or another or on the railroad track itself and uh, was attracted to the houses here in the neighborhood. When cops searched Benton's house, they found fingerprints and they were a match with this man, Rafael Resendez Ramirez, a mysterious drifter who rides the rails. 
His criminal record dates back to the 1970s. And in 1995, he was arrested in California for trespassing on railroad property and carrying a gun. Now, cops thought he was traveling in Claudia Benton's red Jeep. After Resendez Ramirez was named as a suspect, we went back to the tracks for another look. You ever heard of a guy named, uh, Rafael Resendez Ramirez? Rafael, what? We're looking for a guy who, uh, who rides the rails a lot, and he was known to be in this camp every so often. Oh, really? Yeah, he's wanted for murder. Like a really brutal murder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> his name is his name is Rafael Resendez Ramirez. Um, well, I haven't seen anybody around here. Resendez Ramirez remains a complete mystery. We don't even really have a true, correct social security number. He keeps using made-up fake numbers wherever he goes. Two days after Claudia Benton was killed, her red Jeep was found in a parking lot in San Antonio, right by the railroad tracks. Detectives think Resendez Ramirez simply ditched the Jeep and hopped a train, and now it is likely this criminal is riding the rails, destination unknown. You need to help get him off the rails and into jail. Rafael Resendez Ramirez uses at least a half dozen aliases. This is a picture of him from 1995. He has a faded tattoo on his left forearm, scars on his left arm, his forehead, and a small one on his right ring finger. He may or may not be wearing glasses. If you've seen Rafael Resendez Ramirez, call 1-800-CRIME-TV. Up later, the fugitive who pretended he was hunting himself. Hey, did you think you could get away with posing as a U.S. Marshal? I did get away with it. So how did cops catch their man? We'll tell you the naked truth. September 30th, 1975, the Wyandotte County Jail in Kansas. Just another stop in the penal system for Dennis Lilly. The state had sent Lilly up for one to five years for theft and burglary. But after just three days, Lilly decided he'd had enough. I knew Dennis Lilly was a, an escape risk. Uh, he had a nickname as Slick, and he was Slick. He was a very devious man. He's very studious, articulate, very calculating. Uh, an escape to him is just a game. Uh, and one that he intends to win when he plays it. Lily was captured just nine days later and sent to a high security facility, the Kansas State Penitentiary. Breaking out of maximum security took a little longer, but after two years of waiting for the right opportunity, Lily hijacked a prison truck on July 19, 1977. Lily's freedom was short-lived. He was back in the Kansas State Pen within three weeks. It's 3262. Got it? Got it. Then figured a way out again. Yeah. Somehow Lily got the phone number for a guard tower, and he had an accomplice call the guard, telling the guard someone would relieve him. That someone was Lily. He'd stolen enough pieces of a guard's uniform from the prison laundry to pull off the scheme. Yeah. They came to Industrial Yard 1 about half an hour ago. Yeah, I saw him. All right. Lay down, you won't get hurt. You're not serious. Indeed I am. I'm stomach. Mouth shut if you want to live, understand? Yeah, yeah. Take him down. Take the gun. What? I'll take care of him. Then, with the help of two other inmates, Lily made his break once again. Very creative, very slick, manipulative. All the details in his escapes are planned out very well. The guy can make a lot of money writing movies about escapes. The escapee stole a car and headed for Kansas City. Sergeant Doug Kanzler was on routine patrol. He hadn't gotten word of the prison break. I saw a car coming over the hill. They saw me, and they cut back behind the car. I thought to myself, if these guys 
were either drunk or had a stolen car or whatever, so I turned around and started after them. I'm going to need some backup. At that point, I really didn't know what I had. I was still thinking that it's a possible stolen car, but they had come back clean. At that point, all I wanted to do was keep it in sight until uh, help arrived. He's coming around the back. four times and I didn't know where the bullets were coming from so I started rolling around on the ground and they shot again the fifth bullet that didn't hit me was lodged in the barrel of the shotgun so when I took the shot the shotgun blew up on me and it split the barrel and all the gas and everything come out the sides of the barrel I'm thinking boy I'm gonna lay out here in the middle of this yard and die all alone and I don't even know why I didn't know how bad I was hit and at that point dying couldn't hurt any worse and I was ready to go Authorities launched an intensive manhunt. A few hours later, the search ended in nearby Wyandotte County. One more! Get on the ground! Once again, Dennis Lilly was a guest of the state. This time, his accommodations were at the Missouri State Penitentiary. I'm your new shadow slick. Every time you turn, I'm gonna be there. Even though Lily knew he only had a few escapes from this institution, that didn't stop him. He was always scheming, always uh, trying to figure a way to beat the system. He tried to escape from me three times. December 13th, 1986. Lily walked out of here on a Saturday afternoon. The shift changed. He walked uh, through two security points, actually three security points, in an officer's uniform. He had uh, a uniform that he had either stolen from the clothing factory or from our cleaning plant, and he had a, a false ID card that he used at the security point. Hey, 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 whoa, ho! Since I have 440 uniformed officers here, he just wasn't recognized as being an inmate. Now we've got to bring him back again. Here's Lily in a 1975 booking photo. He's used the aliases Larry Miller, Keith Ambergie, and David Lutz. This photo was taken after the shootout with the police. Lily's worked as a carpenter, but can talk his way into any job. He's very articulate and polite. This is the most recent photo of Lily, taken in 1986. The FBI also created this computer-age picture of Lily. Lily has family in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he may be traveling with his wife and teenage daughter, who has bright red hair. If you've seen Dennis Lily, call 1-800-CRIME-TV. Coming up next. cops are chasing the jewel thief. Only one cop knows how dangerous he can be. And only you can bring him in. And later, a vicious gas station slave. The mysterious killer gets away. But was there a mystery witness to the crime? Don't hang up yet, sir. Don't hang up. Damn it. Hello? Nashville, North Carolina. One week ago today, in this quiet city, disaster struck. Someone bombed an abortion clinic here. 
It sounded like it might be the work of one of our most notorious fugitives, Eric Rudolph, a ruthless killer who police think is hiding out in a forest just 75 miles from Asheville. Rudolph's been charged in connection with the bombing at an Alabama abortion clinic that killed a policeman. He's also wanted for three other bombings, including the 1996 Olympic blast in Atlanta. The FBI says it's too soon to tell whether Rudolph is connected to the North Carolina bombing. Any similarities to any other bombings throughout the country will be thoroughly investigated to ascertain in a definitive matter if there's any type of tie-in with any other uh, bombs throughout the country. Eric Rudolph is still wanted for his other crimes. If you've seen Eric Rudolph, or if you know anything about the bombing of the abortion clinic in North Carolina last week, please call one 800 Crime TV. Now, our next case. Cops have no way of knowing exactly how many robberies Enrique Corapuna and his gang have pulled off. But they do know this. The robberies they've linked him to have been the most dangerous they've seen. And the people who come in contact with him are lucky to be alive. This is real video of a violent jewelry store holdup. Police say this man, Enrique Corapuna, led this daring robbery in Arlington, Virginia in July 1992. Police say he violently beat several employees before getting away with $35,000. We've reenacted Corapuna's next armed robbery. Police say on November 11th, 1992, Corapuna and his gang entered a family-owned jewelry store in Linden, New Jersey. Cops are coming. But this time, they ran into some unexpected resistance. The family wasn't giving in without a fight. Get out of my store, you guys are dead. Cops are coming. You're going to be dead. Shut up. We were all yelling and screaming at him, making noise, telling them, somebody's coming. Look out. They're going to be here. Watch out. There they are. Anything we could think of to try and spook them a little bit that maybe they would panic and run. Get out of here, man. I pulled the alarm right The out. store owners had also triggered a silent alarm, and that brought the cops. Officer Al Goncalves was the first to arrive, and police say Cora Puna quickly ambushed him. Bullet never penetrated my vest. Made me take a deep breath. It was like a sledgehammer or a hammer. Take a hard blow to my chest. I drew my weapon and I had a fire from the hip. And I fired one round into the shooter. Corapuna and his gang jumped into their getaway car. That led to a high-speed chase through the residential streets of Linden, New Jersey. chase came to a screeching halt. The gang fled on foot. <laughs> Linden police were able to round up nearly all of the gang, but Enrique Corapuna had managed to get away. Look closely at this surveillance video of Corapuna again. Corapuna has a short, stocky build and may or may not wear glasses now. Corapuna speaks with a thick Peruvian accent and goes by the nickname Kiki. We've aged enhanced our only mugshot of Corapuna to show you what he might look like today. If you've seen Enrique Corapuna, please call 1-800-CRIME-TV. Now, Corapuna's been on the run for seven years. He's way overdue to be taken down. Now, let's go to Darlene McCarthy with tonight's APB. Darlene, what have you got for us? John, thanks. Tonight's All Points Bulletin starts in Illinois, 
where cops are working on a mysterious murder that could be solved by an even more mysterious witness. April 16, 1997, Orland Park, Illinois, the Shell gas station on Wolf Road. The video surveillance camera catches it all. A stranger dressed in a camouflage poncho enters the Mini Mart, walks to the counter, and shoots the clerk, Robert Collins, once in the head. Then, without stealing a thing, the stranger leaves, leaving behind more questions than answers. Why would anyone want to kill Robert Collins, a hard-working man with no enemies? Was it a planned hit, or was it a robbery gone bad? Even though nothing was taken in the store, you still can't discount a robbery. Did he intentionally uh, fire the gun? I don't know. Uh, the fact remains that uh, the victim was shot one time, and uh, he was killed. With no leads, the investigation was looking bleak. Then, cops got this 911 phone call. <laughs> of many companies across the country and cannot find any Bob Reynolds with any pool trucking. Bob, if that is your real name, we need you to call our hotline tonight. And uh, maybe if he doesn't hear it himself, someone's going to recognize that voice. Uh, it's a distinct voice. It's a sincere voice. And uh, I'm sure somebody out there will get a hold of him and help us out. As for the shooter, cops can't be certain, but they think he's a male standing five feet eight. He drove away in a dark blue or brown van. If you have any information that can help close this case, make that call. Inside this house in Detroit, Michigan, a man sexually molested his stepdaughter for nine years. His name? Randolph Bernat. When the girl was 13, she confided in a relative. That relative then told authorities what he had done. But Bernat's daughter became frightened. I told them that, uh, that I made it up, that I didn't have a Why did you do that at that time? because he told me that he was going to kill himself. Afraid that he would carry out his threat and she would be blamed, she put up with Baronet's sexual advances for three more years. Then she ran away. It wasn't until another relative found a box of videotapes that the truth could be told. Those tapes showed Mr. Baronet having sexual relations with his stepdaughter. Along with the tapes, police also found a book on father-daughter incest. Biernat was arrested and he pled guilty, but on the day of his sentencing, he never showed. Instead, he sent the judge a letter. In the letter, he tells the judge that he was mentally ill during the abuse, but he got better. He also said he didn't want to die in prison and that he would do anything to stay out, like perform community service or be chemically castrated. We've got a better idea. Let's put him behind bars and let the justice system figure out what to do with this sicko. Randolph Allen Baronat is 43 years old. He may have grown a beard and he may be losing his hair. Cops say he still could be in the state of Michigan, but he also has family in Indiana. If you've seen Randolph Baronat, call 1-800-CRIME-TV. Now there's one breaking story we have to update you on. We have been following the story of the three women from California who disappeared during a trip to Yosemite National Park. Well, Thursday night, the women's charred rental car was discovered in a remote area about two hours from the park. And then on Friday, everyone's worst fears were realized when the FBI announced that two bodies were found in the trunk of that car. There was no sign of a third body. Now the search has become a homicide investigation and we still need your help to bring it to a close. The victim's family is offering a $300,000 reward for information. So, if you know anything about this case, now is the time to call our hotline. John? Thanks, Darlene. Now, this isn't over, not by a long shot. We've been with this family throughout this ordeal, and we're going to be with them until they find justice. Whoever did this is not going to get away with it. 
We'll have a special report on the case next week. And remember, there is a reward, but I know somebody knows something about this case. Please have the courage to make that call. And remember, you can remain anonymous. Now stay with us. We'll be right back. Coming up, this fugitive may have found the ultimate hiding place. He told me he was uh, working undercover. But the cops uncovered the truth. So how was his hoax exposed? We'll reveal everything next. The America's Most Wanted magazine. It's the magazine with a mission. You can help us find missing children, hunt down the AMW Top 10, and more. You'll get street smart with Sanford, and every issue catch a special column by John Walsh. And if you order now, you'll get a free copy of One Tough Computer Cop. This CD-ROM program is a simple way for parents to protect their kids from predators and pedophiles on the Internet. A one-year subscription is just $24.95. To order, call toll-free 1-877-AMW-GEAR. That's 1-877-269-4327. Remember, the CD-ROM is free, but it's a limited-time offer. So order now and join the AMW team. Naked bathing beauties, that's what Black's Beach in San Diego, one of the nation's premier nude beaches, has been famous for. It's also known for its treacherous cliffs and hang gliding daredevils. And now it could add one more thing, the capture of one of America's most wanted. His name, Mark Allen. One day you talk to him, he's a fine person, outstanding young man. The next day he's a rising lunatic. Police say this raving lunatic is a rampaging robber. He's got a rap sheet a mile long, dating back to 1985. Marshall say he's robbed four post offices at gunpoint, stuck up a Waffle House, and was caught on surveillance tape robbing a supermarket in Georgia. They also say he escaped from a city jail. And if that wasn't enough, on May 23rd last year, he pulled off a carjacking in a car wash. The soap, that thing was coming over the car, and I caught a movement out of the corner of my left eye. He just got me, caught me around my neck, and was, and I was pushing this away, and he was pushing this away, and, and finally he just came out and said, if you do not cooperate with me, I will kill you. Alan took Nellie Compton on a terrifying ride, he dumped her off unharmed at this barbecue pit. Then he took off leaving Marshalls to hunt him down once again. Four months later, Alan's hideout was uncovered, so to speak, at Black's Beach. He was driving through this parking lot at this San Diego hang glider port when he unexpectedly ran right into the hands of Officer Michael Jones. I saw a, a white Jeep uh, driving fast up and down the uh, aisles and kicking up dust. And I'd already run the plate through the system and it came back as a stolen car. Uh, I drew out my gun and I had him prone out on the ground. I just went in and handcuffed him. Allen was caught by surprise, but knowing the officer had no idea who he was, this con artist had one more trick up his sleeve, masquerading as a U.S. Marshal. When Officer Jones searched the Jeep, he found a goodie bag filled with U.S. Marshal paraphernalia, including a gun, pellet spray, and what appeared to be an authentic U.S. Marshal ID. Allen quickly became the first fugitive to try to get away by saying he was hunting himself. He told me he was uh, working undercover and he was tracking a fugitive. And he gave me the fugitive, fugitive name as Mark J. Allen. But the officer was not fooled. He ran Allen's name through the computer. The description matched the supposed U.S. Marshal in the Jeep. I said, the person you said you're tracking, you fit his description exactly. And he admitted he was the fugitive, Mark Allen. He did say, uh, officers, uh, you can be proud of yourself today. You did something good. Allen was flown back to Greenville, South Carolina, where he was charged with carjacking and escape. Hey, did you think he could get away with posing as a U.S. Marshal? I did get away with it. But he didn't. Allen was found guilty and sentenced to a total of 77 years in prison. The only way to stop Mark Allen is to do what we just did, which is put him in jail for the rest of his life. And for Nellie Compton, that was good news. I hope I never have to look upon his face ever again, because he's a very, very sick person. 
Up next, another murder is caught on tape. Then, the shooter goes after an innocent bystander. They're brazen. They'll, they'll shoot anybody, anywhere. The cops say this gang may be responsible for 30 murders. In an exclusive interview, one former member takes you inside the gang. I right, when you shoot somebody, you kill somebody, you got a reward. Life in Baltimore, Maryland in 1996. They say he may be in New York and often uses the nickname Beetle. Call if you can help. Dallas, Texas police are looking for this man, Jesus Antonio Tejeda, an accused child killer. They say while Jesus and his brother Juan were babysitting Joel Hernandez, the two beat the toddler to death. Joel's body was found four days later buried in a field outside Dallas. Juan is awaiting trial, but Jesus Tejeda is still on the run. Police say Jesus Tejeda is a heavy drinker, goes by the nickname El Tigre. He could have fled to Mexico. If you've seen this accused killer, call our hotline. We've been bringing you stories from time to time to show you how drugs affect not just the people who use them, but everyone around them. Entire communities can get caught in the crossfire, and nobody's safe from the scourge of drugs. No case illustrates that as clearly or as violently as the case of the Miami gang known as the Booby Boys. John Turchin has the latest. When you mess with his crew, you whack anybody in his crew, he whacks you or get you wet. They're brazen. They'll, they'll shoot anybody, anywhere. It has really ruined my life. It's a deadly battle over a multi-million dollar drug trade, and it's strangling Miami's most embattled neighborhoods. There's no uh, consideration for life. They want to make a point um, that uh, they're in charge. They, they're not afraid to push somebody out of an area, and uh, that's what they'll do. Police say Miami drug gangs armed with AK-47 assault rifles marked their territory with grisly effect. They're responsible for hundreds of gruesome murders and shootings since 1992. Living by the law of the street, take or be taken, no one in the community is immune. Innocent bystanders, beware. Investigators say most of the violence can be attributed to the Booby Boys, a ruthless gang named after Kenneth Booby Williams. This former gang member would only talk to us anonymously. People fear him. He's a murderer. He's a killer. He don't play. Booby Williams has apparently always been that way. The 27-year-old with the laughable street name Booby grew up mean, in serious trouble since he was a teenager. He went to jail as a juvenile for a homicide case. Um, after getting out of that, uh, doing time for that homicide, he set up business by... Uh, virtually doing uh, drug rip-offs and, and burglaries and any way else he can make money. His rise to drug lord, police say, was methodical, muscling in on other dealers' territory. His motivation? Cold, hard cash. Does he always want to take over whatever operation is going in any nearby town? No, well, his whole thing is that it was money, though. It's money for everybody. Uh, if you don't want to let me get none of that money, I'll move you up. Move you out, cops say, often meant a rub out for those who wouldn't go quietly. Kenneth Williams and his group is responsible for 30 plus homicides and well over 100 non critical shootings in Dade County alone. 99 bullet casings at one scene, 46 at another. Startling evidence of the Booby Boys' muscle was recorded on surveillance tape at a local convenience store. One of Booby's lieutenants uh, wanted to sell out of that store. The group already selling drugs there let the booby boys in, but sales were slow. So police say Williams sent in two hitmen to eliminate the other group and take over the entire store for the booby boys. Their whole task was to shoot this person. Uh, it wasn't just to rob them. Uh, it wasn't just to let them know that they shouldn't be selling there. It was to basically uh, kill someone, to teach them, uh, I guess, not to... Uh, not to walk on their territory. I mean, you shoot somebody up, kill somebody, AK, kill somebody. It's like, you got a reward. Cops say the gang doesn't care who's nearby. Watch as one of the suspects chases someone down the street, firing as he runs. One didn't have to be involved in the drug trade to become a victim. November 1992, Ruth Russell and her boyfriend, Leon Ferguson, returned to Leon's home late one night to discover the front door open. 
Mr. Ferguson immediately drives into the driveway, jumps out of the car, and I immediately follow him. Upon entering the house, there were gunshots. I came through the door, next thing I knew, I got shot, and it was like a burning sensation. That was the first of many shots to come. They describe it as a war zone. They were surrounded. Shooters at the front of the house, more gunfire coming from the back. Mr. Ferguson is a Vietnam vet. His instincts were to hit the ground. Miss Russell's to find a way to survive. Just lying there and hearing the bullets, it was something like out of the movies, the Wild Wild West. Ruth and Leon got caught in the crossfire of a drug ripoff, and police suspect Williams was involved. There were approximately six bullets that struck me in the right leg, and there were two others in the left leg. How bad were the injuries? The right leg had, had to be amputated because of the main artery being damaged. It has really ruined my life. While Ruth lost her leg, five-year-old Michael Frazier lost his life. Cops say Michael was sitting on his mother's lap in her boyfriend's car when the booby boys opened fire on the boyfriend. All three were gunned down. Does Booby ever go out there and do any of the shootings himself? Yeah. Everybody's focusing on the murder, murder that he's been involved with shooting. Oh, but these guys are bringing in tons of drugs in, in from overseas. What kind of money does this guy make? He touched maybe like a hundred, two, three hundred thousand a month. And where does Williams keep all that money? Police believe he buries much of it underground. Well, I never got money from him. You can feel the dirt on the money because he loves to bury his money. That's his, that's, his, that's his whole thing. Police say Kenneth Williams' multi-million dollar drug web now extends north through just about every city in Florida. Into Georgia, through the Carolinas, into Virginia, and as far north as Detroit. They also believe he's moving west into Las Vegas. Local police formed a task force last year to put a stop to the violence. They realized that many of the crimes involving unstoppable firepower were connected. Nearly always, there was a tie to Kenneth Williams and the Booby Boys. Now, most gang members are either dead or in custody. But Kenneth Williams is on the run. He's believed to be splitting time between Atlanta, the Bahamas, and Miami. And agents say he likes to go to big boxing matches in Las Vegas. The DEA wants him badly, and they've issued a reward. If you've seen Kenneth Booby Williams, call 1-800-PROM. Now, we've got one more alert to bring you tonight. Another missing persons case in California is taking a frightening new turn. A few weeks ago, we told you about two beautiful young women who disappeared from the same campus in San Luis Obispo. Well, now a third student from the same town is missing, and we've got to find her tonight. Residents of San Luis Obispo are stunned by the disappearance of 20-year-old Andrea Crawford. Andrea, a student at local Cuesta College, hasn't been seen since March 10th. The search of her duplex leads police to believe Andrea may have been abducted. Let's bring her home tonight. If you know anything about the disappearance of Andrea Crawford, please call us at 1-800-CRIME-TV. Now, here's a quick review of tonight's cases. Michael Buttram is wanted for a double homicide in Georgia last week. Top shooter Dennis Lilly has escaped from the Missouri State Penitentiary. Rafael Resendez Ramirez is wanted for killing a doctor near Houston, Texas. This suspect is wanted for killing a gas station attendant in Cook County, Illinois. Randolph Fearnot is wanted for the sexual abuse of his stepdaughter. Jesus Tejeda is wanted in Texas for the murder of a two-year-old boy. And Kenneth Booby Williams is the reputed leader of a dangerous Miami drug gang. I'm John Walsh. Thanks a lot for watching. And remember, you can...